pray for a supernatural manifestation of the heavenly physician to step into every situation that is blood related, sugar diabetes, heart condition, whatever it is, oh God. We pray, oh God, for an Holy Ghost blood purification. Purify every blood cell in the house this morning. We command a transformation of our body in the name of Jesus that will translate into a healthy lifestyle. May every sickness bow in the name of Jesus. Thank you eternal rock of ages. Have your way Lord in Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. I uh, just want to go straight uh, into the scriptures and uh, we pray uh, this morning. If you have your Bible, can you open to the book of Judges chapter 11? I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I want to challenge you. Read the whole chapter later this week or later today when you get home. and uh, You can get the whole picture there. Uh, Judges chapter one, uh, chapter eleven, from verse one, and Jephthah the Gilalite, or the was a mighty warrior, but he was a son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when his wise sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows and uh, vain men collected around Jephthah and went out with him. And after a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, come and be our leader, that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come now when you are in distress? Oh, Jesus. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, that is why we have turned to you. that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head and be head over all the inhabitants in Gilead. And Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you bring me home to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, will I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be witness between us if we do not do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and leader over them, the same man that was rejected and driven away just now. I, uh, God is doing something for someone. Other, your situation that looks so bad, they, mm, 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 mm. and Jephthah spoke his word before the Lord at Mizpah. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites and say, what do you have against me that you have come to fight against my land? And the king of the Ammonite answered the messenger of Jephthah, because Israel on coming up from Egypt took away my land from the Anon to the Jabbok and to the Jordan. Now therefore restore it peaceably. I um, you need to read the whole story. 
And like I said, uh, I won't read the whole chapter this morning. I want to challenge you again because the whole idea is to do it yourself. I want you to learn that if you're not doing that religiously, to begin to open the word yourself, to begin to dive into the scriptures so that you can be liberated from the manipulations of man. And this story is very, very interesting story. And this story, I believe by the Spirit, Spirit of God, that it is for you and for me. I don't know who is it for in particular this morning, but the story of Jephthah is an interesting story. So I want to speak to the Jephthahs in the house this morning, the ones whose pedigree has become a stigma and to them, the ones whose background or their past or their story or their history has become a stumbling block to them. I want to speak to the one who, though you are where you are today, not by choice, but by circumstances. I want to speak to the one who have been rejected and ostracized by his community or his family by the reason of the issues in your life. This morning, this morning, this morning, I, uh, Jephthah, the Bible started in, by describing him as a mighty warrior, a mighty man of valor, a man of strength. He, he had a gift, but his credential as a mighty man of valor is now being overshadowed by his past. Great man, but his past would not let him be, would not let him step out to become whom God has called him to be. She's a mighty woman, born to be a great mother, but her past will not let her live her life to his fullness. Uh, he's a gifted son. He, he's an intelligent, smart boy. But his past will not let him rise. Jephthah was a mighty man of valor, but he was a son of a prostitute, a harlot. So every time Jephthah tries to rise up, his past came crashing on him. Does that sound familiar this morning? Every time he's tried to make something out of his life, his past becomes a tool in the hand of the enemy. His past is gradually becoming his present reality. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. And because of his past, Jephthah could not flaunt his credential. I'm gifted, I can do this. But his past overshadows all the good qualities because that is all the enemy has been able to make men see of Jephthah. Is the enemy still using your past to intimidate you? And when the enemy wants to use your past to intimidate you, he's not going to use strangers to do that. He's not going to use the man on the street to do that. He's going to use your friends. He's going to use your parents. He's going to use your teacher. He's going to use your pastor because those are the ones whose word is strong that carries weight. Because it was his own brothers that said to him, that reminded him of his past. Not a stranger. The strangers could deal with Jephthah. The strangers could look beyond his faults. But not so the ones who grew up with him, who knew him, 
so to speak. She's been a prostitute. They will never let you rise above your past. Your friends may not let you rise above your past. Even your teachers, your parents, you, you are a failure. You are a dullard. You are, you are a thief. You are a crackhead. What is that past in your life that keep rising up every time you want to make a move for God? And in these instances, and, 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 and the, the dangerous thing about this story and about this situation with Jephthah is this, and, and like many of us, and this stigma has nothing to do with him. <laughs> his parents' choice, his parents' mistakes, though not his fault, it wasn't his fault. Jephthah did not say, I want to be born by a prostitute. You know, that was not his choice. Do not his fault but now be made to live with the consequences of somebody else's fault. Is that not familiar? when people now begin to label and tag you based on your parents' life. That is the son of that, do you know that man that stole the other day? That is the son going there. You know that woman that was, uh, uh, was caught in adultery on 97th Avenue with uh, this man's wife? You, you know that? That is the son. That is the daughter of that same woman. And, and, and you want to go marry from that family? like mother, like daughter. Don't you, don't you know the father of the man that you were fucking to? Don't you know that his father killed a man in anger two years ago? Anger runs in that family. Now, it was not your fault, but now you are made to leave and to bear the shame on somebody else's mistake. This was the life of Jephthah. This is the life of so many people in the world today. It's not about what you did or didn't do. It's about what somebody else's did on your behalf. And now you are made to live with the consequences. So their fault becomes your disgrace and your shame. But I hear the spirit of the Lord saying, to tell you, child of God, enough. 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 Breathe on me, sweet spirit of God. The reason why Christ was made manifest in the flesh was to destroy every works of the devil. Galatians 3.13 said he has come to redeem us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for you and for me. And hung on that cross to declare to the powers that be that every written code of the enemy that was against you, that had been working against you, she's been nailed to the cross. And I want to let you know that God is saying you should not continue to bear the shame and the reproach and the disgrace of somebody else's mistake. Your mother was a prostitute. That does not translate into you as one as well. Your father may have killed somebody. That is not you.
son. So I think about this. I think about lives that has been head bound. People have been driven out of their destiny because of things like this. Words spoken over their lives based on somebody else's definition of you and me that is not true at all. And I've said this to you before. And I said, I remember my late dad saying, you guys will not amount to anything. And literally speaking, as God is my witness. So there's no need for me to waste my money on you. So he indirectly sentenced me and my siblings to talk. And we could. It is more dangerous. You see, authority is a big thing. The enemy understands that. When a stranger speaks ill of you, it does not affect you. But when you give men access to your life, they become a form of authority. When they speak, it holds water. That's why people <coughs> learn to treat relationships with honor and with dignity. Don't put your selfishness and greed and wreck destinies because of that. When the parents speak to their children, they are speaking from a platform of authority. When a teacher speaks to their children, uh, to their students, they're speaking from a platform of authority. So it carries weight. So the enemy knows that. So he puts those over you that will amplify his vision over your life. Listen to me. But whatever they have spoken or whatever they have said, that same God that delivered me that same God that set me free, that same God. As I look at my children, my wife has said, I should keep their stories at home. I can talk about my story. <laughs> that was the warning I've been getting. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I... When I, I look at my children, I'm looking at what I say to them. Not just what I say, how I live. I make, apart from, listen to me now, apart from my relationship with Christ and my desire for thy heavenly home, which is on top of the list, making moral choices also is because of them. The choices I make, the sacrifice I make, because the Bible says in the book of Acts, this is the beginning of what Jesus began to teach and to do. It's not enough to talk to them. It's not enough to teach them. They need to see it. So I make moral sacrifice and choices if I like No matter how convenient or inconvenient it is to my flesh, because of them. So when I see them, when I speak to them, I speak into the destiny that is yet to be, but I have become in the realm of the spirit that nothing, that my, their destiny will not be aborted 
because of my mistakes and my wrong choices. I make that. That when I stand before the one who has entrusted them to me tomorrow, when the curtain is drawn from this part of the earth, I can say to him, with all humility like Abimelech, I raise them in the integrity of my heart. God forbid, if they fail, it's not because I fail them as a father. And I can stand before the maker. But speaking life to these children, speaking life to the ones who have been entrusted to you, because they are mighty men and women of greatness and valor. No one is a mistake. No one is an afterthought. No one is brought, bought or born, brought into this world and marked to be a failure. Born of a prostitute, yet a mighty man of valor. And I've realized something, that, what am I saying? When we speak to people, learn to talk to people who are in relationship with you, be it your wife, your husband, your children, your students, your co-worker. Learn to correct people without putting them down. Learn to correct people without feelings. Don't come to me with that sense of superiority complex. You can't be my father, it doesn't matter. You lose me when you do that. You lose your children when you do that. You lose your students when you do that. Jesus in John chapter 4 met a woman who had a terrible past but a glorious future. We call her the Samaritan woman by the well. Everyone has confronted that woman and made her feel nothing but death and pain. But when she met Jesus, Jesus did not say something new to her. Do you know that? Everything that Jesus said to her was what everybody has been calling her in town, a woman about town. You know what I mean? And she's just changing men. No, she's, uh, she's free for all. She, she, the same word, the same thing, but Jesus dignified her presence with his attention. He spoke to her. He corrected her in love. The same word that she have heard people say to her that will make her throw her a water pot and begin to fight them on the street. That same word was spoken by somebody else and it melted her heart. How do you address the mistakes of the people in your life? That being said, for you that has been broken, been hurt, been put down this morning, been rejected, ostracized, cut off from the common web of your family and the community of friends, you must know this. David says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This my soul know it well. People's opinion of you, if you are not wrong, does not count. Why am I saying that? Jephthah knew something about himself. That the man's definition of him could not stop him. You must come to understand that people, some people, would never like you. A lot of people will not accept you. Deal with it and move on. 
There are people in your life that will never get over your past. Deal with it. Don't settle with them. Don't sit down to try to convince people like that. There are people in this world, no matter how you change, don't try to impress them because they will never get over your past. Because out of wickedness or out of that superiority complex and intimidation, they will never get over it. Because that is the only weapon they have against you. That's all they have. And so for them to let go of that, then that means you will become better than them. So they would have changed. I, I, I don't steal no more. I don't do drugs no more. I'm, I'm, I'm no longer a prostitute. I, they will never get over that. To them, you are still that. Because that is the only way they will feel good about themselves. So deal with that and move on. Don't stay with those people. Move on with your life. That was Jephthah. They couldn't deal with him. They still looked at him as the son of a prostitute. So he excused himself and moved on. Because if you keep settling with, for mediocrity and for this, to try to convince these people to, to believe you and to accept you, you will waste your entire life trying to please men and never fulfilling your God-given purpose. By trying to impress men, you are indirectly placing human limitation on your own potential. So sometimes it's not the people around you. Yeah, the people around you could be placing that limitation on you based on your past, but it is by your permission. If you do not permit them, they can't do it. Jephthah said, no, I'm not going to stay here and let you guys ruin this thing inside of me. I'm going to take it to where it will work for me. The point is to you, Jephthah, whose definition of your life are you working with? Whose playbook are you playing by? Like Adam and Eve, when God came to them in the Garden of Eden, they've always been naked. They were created naked. And suddenly somebody came and told them, and when God, when Adam said to God, he said, we were naked and we hide, and that's why we've been hiding from you. Listen to me, man's definition of you can only bring nothing but shame and humiliation, and it will continue to curse you to hide. They make you hide in shame because they try to remind you of where you're coming from, that you can never live there. So Adam said, God, we heard your voice and we are hiding because we're naked. And God said, who told you? Who told you that you're naked? Listen to me, Jephthah, this morning. That you are not useful here does not mean you're useless. Does not mean you cannot be useful somewhere else. Jephthah understood that. Don't take man's rejection of you as a death sentence. I wrote this a few days ago. Now I read it to you this way. Your value does not decrease based on someone's inability to see your what. That they did not see Jephthah's worth at that point in time does not mean he stopped being a mighty man of valor, a mighty man of war. 
that people do not see your world right now, that they can't see past your past, does not mean you are still there. You don't need to accept that. No value. This is what the Holy Spirit is breathing upon us. God is calling you to a place this morning. And so when we allow what other people think of us and what they feel about us to affect us, the reason why most of this emotion, suicide are taught, and the sense of rejection, unwantedness, and hopelessness, despair, All of this emotion is rising in us every now and again because we have come to believe the report of man above God's word. You've come to believe that nothing good can ever come out of your life. You've come to believe that indeed you are a son or a daughter of a harlot and this is who you are and that is what it is and there is nothing that can happen. Nothing can change that. This is who, my father was like this. This is the way I'm going to end. My mother was divorced at the age of 30. I can see my marriage breaking before I'm 35 anyway. I see that happening. My daddy died at the age of 45. Now I'm 44. There is nothing that can rescue me from that curse. If any man be in Christ, behold, is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What does it mean? What is the name? You see, the name, I've told you this time and time again. Jeremiah, before I say what I want to say, I want you to write this down. Jeremiah 31, verse 29 says, No longer with the teeth of the children be on edge because their father ate a sour grape. What God is saying, the mistakes of your parents, you will no longer live their consequences. He said no longer. In Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 2, he said, what is this proverb? Courage, can you find that and put it off for me? I want to read that before I say anything more. I just feel to let you see that. He said, Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 2. He said, what is this proverb? Because I don't want to quote it out of context. But I know the scripture. He said, what is this proverb in your mouth? What do you mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? Now this is what God is saying. What do you mean? By keep saying the same thing about this family. The fathers ate sour grape, and the children's feet are set on edge. Verse 3, can you put verse 3 of that same scripture for me? As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. No longer. This is what Jesus came to do on the cross. He came to put an end to those negative proverbs and confession and saying, this is the way we are. We were born that way. My life is this way. My father was that way. My mother was that way. So there is no hope for me anymore. And God said, how dare you say that after you have embraced the cross of Christ Jesus? Jephthah, the name Jephthah, come back to that name. What does it mean? Because a name speaks about your future, your destiny, and your purpose in life. That's why you don't name your child after one lousy Hollywood movie star, after watching his movie. Mm, I'm telling you that now. 
Because a name speaks about your destiny, about your future. So every time you call the name, like they say, you are who and what your name is. <laughs> when you call my name, you are speaking into my future. Jephthah means to open. <laughs> the mother, even in her brokenness, in her darkness, she began to declare Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 2 and 3 already that my son will not be victim of what I was. Hmm. My son will not end up like me. Yes, I was a prostitute, but this one will outdo me. Like I always tell my children, I say you guys will be better. You will improve on my life. You will be ten times better than me. My tears becomes your joy. Where I failed, you will succeed. Where I was disappointed, there you will be appointed. Where I failed, that will be the beginning of your rising. No, you cannot be like me. You are not destined to be like me. You are destined to be better than me. You are better than me every which way. When I pray for my children, when I speak to them, Talking to them the other day, we're talking about things, about correction. The same thing I said to them. The vehicle coming home and I said, listen. I said, you must learn to accept correction with a good attitude. I said, if not, you become easily intimidated. You become insecure in yourself. That somebody is correcting you does not mean that you are wrong. I say, correction is not a definition of who you are. It just simply means you are better than this. You see, that is, that is correction. When I correct you, what I'm saying to you, but again, is how I say it. <laughs> huh? Because when I correct you in love, I will say to you, by my words, when Jesus saw the woman by the well, what he was saying to her is that you are better than five men. He corrects. When I correct my children, I say, when you hear correction from your teacher, don't let the enemy amplify it to mean that is who you are. This is what we hear. That is the lie of the devil. The reason why we get angry we get cynical, we get bitter over correction, is that what we hear is that this is who we are. But correction simply means you are better than this. But again, it depends on the one correcting you. So, and I tell them, I say, listen, don't ever carry a sorry fix when your teacher corrects you, whether it be in public. I say, you are a son of a lion. Take it and roar. Just simply means I can improve on this. Jephthah means to open. A glorious destiny awaits you, Jephthah. The mother was saying to Jephthah, your life is going to be better than me. Your destiny will open you have come into this family to become the liberator. You have come to set us free. You have come to be the bondage breaker. Through you, the name of this family shall go through the four corners of the earth. But how can this be, mother? I don't know how it's going to happen, but faithful is he that has called you son. I know, don't ever believe Whatever anybody tells you, they are liars. Remember the son of whose you are. Remember the one who gave birth to you. I gave you that name because I know the God whom I serve and whom I have come to believe that you are a mighty warrior. You are going to break the bondage, not just of the family. The same people that are looking down at you today, son, if you keep holding your head high, they will come looking for you tomorrow. I believe that Jephthah's mother sang him to sleep with those words. 
He comes home crying, looking like a weakling. And the mother says, how dare you stand up like the man that you are? Yeah, they call you a bastard. That is what they think. But is that who you are? No. You're better than that. And I believe the words of that woman kept stirring his spirit as he's growing up. That remind me of my own biological mother. Believes in me unto death. Because she sees what my father could not see. God is saying to you, chapter, stir up the gift of God that is in you. Don't allow your past to drown your future. The Holy Spirit is coming. What we talk about the gift of the Holy Spirit. He said, if the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the grave, are you in a grave of depression right now? Are you in a grave of failure and despair? Are you in a grave of poverty and lack? Are you in a grave of adultery and sexual perversion and the enemy says there is no hope in you? There is a lie from the pit of hell. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 11, if the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the grave is in you, that same spirit will quicken your mortal body. The Holy Spirit comes to resurrect you. Comes to stir you unto grace. In verse 11 of Judges chapter 29, uh, 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 verse 29 of Judges chapter 11, the Bible said the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. But Jephthah also was a man of the word. Study to show yourself approved. His mother taught him right. When he went to confront the king of the Ammonites, he confronted them based on the word, what was written. And he said, when the king said to him, no, you took my land. And he said, no, 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 no. If you begin to read the subsequent story, Jephthah began to tell him. He said, listen, this is what the word said. God gave us this land. His brothers who were legitimate children did not know the word. The entrance of his word bringeth light. He sent forth his word and his word healed them. Not your pedigree, not your color. It is this that delivers the man. They had the title, but they had nothing backing them up. A man of the word is a man to be feared. A man who can rightly divide the word it should. Listen to me, Jephthah, this morning. Walk your gift in that trenches where you are. Don't fall into depression. Don't accept the defeat of the enemy. Let the word of God stir your spirit back to life. The Bible says, Jephthah, all the disgruntled, listen to me. The people that will celebrate and value your gifting may not look like you. They look like you sometimes. Amen. But the Bible says people, and that reminded you and me of men like David. David was rejected. And who came to him? The broken. Listen to me. If the broken are not attracted to the grace of God in your life, then you don't have something to... You, you know what I mean? If you are too proud to identify with the people in the gutter of sin, then I wondered what kind of call you have. Great man attracts death. They came to Jephthah, and Jephthah began to walk his gift not just only on himself, but on this man also. He began to use what was rejected in the city in this little corner and began to build these destinies up. And suddenly they became the mighty army that liberated a whole nation. God is speaking to you this morning. 
don't fall into depression. Don't accept men's definition of you. Wherever you are now in that state of rejection, begin to walk your gift through the word of God. The Bible says the entrance of his word bringeth light. Psalm 119 verse 130, an understanding to the simple. In that darkness, let the word of God begin to bring light. In Psalm 103, verse 20, it says, Bless his angels that excel in strength and hack it unto the voice of his word. Walk your gift in this. For the word of God is the agent of deliverance. 107 Psalm, verse 20, say he sent forth his word and his word delivered them. Listen to me, child of God. Knowledge brings freedom. I want to stop. Knowledge brings freedom. Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 6 says, My people are destroyed. For lack of knowledge. If you read that whole verse, it is just so sick. Ah, it's disheartening. It said, because my people have rejected knowledge, I will also reject them. Listen to me. I want to stop here. I want to pray. God wants to do something for you. I don't know who you are. You know, you maybe have been called in non entity. You've been called in nobody. But God says you're a mighty man of valor. A mighty woman of valor. That same Jephthah that was rejected because he walked his gift in the trenches became calling for him. As we pray this morning, I want to stop here. I want to encourage you, Jephthah. Don't allow men's opinion trap you and make you feel worthless about yourself. Don't let any man born of a woman look down on you. Don't let anybody think and feel that they are better than you in any way. Like they say, it's one leg at a time. We all wear our pants same way. You know what I'm talking about. Nobody should be. Don't bully people. Don't bully your children. Don't bully people spiritually. Don't use your gift to intimidate the children of God. Use it to build them out of the trenches. If they gravitate to you, it's not because they don't know that they are struggling already. They come to be helped. They came so that you can strengthen them. That you can make them into the armies of God that they are supposed to be. They came to you because they have been rejected like you have been rejected. Don't ever forget where you're coming from. That suddenly you begin to look down your nose on people. And if you've been treated bad, listen to me. God is saying, I want to heal you. Shall we stand up this morning? I think I'll stop here. I'll stop here. I'll stop here. I want you to talk to God. Your spirit needs encouragement right now. 
done. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you hear him clearly. Not the words of your father. Not the words of your teacher anymore. Not the words of your husband. Not the words of your pastor. Every negative word that keep playing in your mind. Every negative experience that keep pulling you down to that habit. That every time you remember those words that they say, that is who you are, you are nothing but a drunk. And then you accept it. Now you are in that debt and you can't get out. Now ask the Holy Spirit to help you to begin to hear voice of hope. That's all I want you to pray for this morning. I believe Chapter refused to allow his brother's voice to define his future. That's why he overcame. The voice of his friends were not strong enough to keep him down. Let the Holy Spirit, ask the Holy Spirit to anoint your ears from today to begin to hear him. Instead of those negative voices, of discouragement and despair and condemnation and judgment. That you begin to hear a new voice of hope, a new voice of deliverance. That you are Jephthah. That you were born into that situation is not a death sentence. No. That you are the way you are. Don't accept it as a death sentence. There is hope for thy future, says the Spirit of the Lord. Because you have been called an outcast, that was the word that delivered me, standing before you here. Look at me as we go. I'm not going to tell you the chapter, but I'll tell you where it is. Jeremiah. I'll say this. Growing up, I was mentally, psychologically battered by words of people, especially my father and uncles. And so sometimes when it took me a while, because I, older people, my dad and my uncles, I've said it all, made me hate men. As God, I hated men. Every definition of man spells nothing but wickedness and lies. I was broken. And to cap it all, I was telling my children, they didn't believe it. Up until, I think about when I turned 17, I have this, what they call vitamin C deficiency, my leg was like this. Uh, I was deformed growing up. And then my belly button, because of high knee, was like this. I was deformed. Physically deformed, mentally deformed growing up. So my father will brutalized me with his words and everything, and the uncles, who was no good, this one, this is no good. And then when I go to school, the teenagers, the kids like you, they make fun of you, you don't have friends, they laugh at you. So I grew up with so much low self-esteem and hate and anger. It was life. When I got safe, it was a struggle. God began to peel, peel the layers off, one after the other. And I remember one day, broken, crying and praying, and I saw the scripture. Restrain your voice from weeping, your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded. And for there is hope for your future. When I read that, something inside of me just blew up. 
And he went down and he said, because you have been called an outcast, Zion for whom no one cares, I will restore you to health and I will heal your wounds. When the Lord spoke that to my spirit that day, everything came off. People ask me, how did you do it? I don't know the Holy Spirit did it. And then suddenly, some type of pride came on me. I went from one airstrip to the other. I became too proud for a season. I didn't even know what to do. Then the Holy Spirit again began to balance so standing before you today, I'm not saying what I don't know. This did it. And so it doesn't matter what people think. Look at you. My passion for God is not, I'm not a pastor because I'm looking for a job or want to impress you. I don't preach because I want somebody else to lie. No, 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 no. This is my heart. This is my life. He saved me. He delivered me. He gave meaning to my life. I'm a walking miracle. Literally standing before you here, I'm a miracle emotion. And so that's why you can't look down on me. You can't. I know whom I believe. I know where I am coming from. My ministry is not a Bible college ministry. It's from the trenches of life. And God is saying to you too, you can have that encounter, that experience, that no man, no woman, no doctor, no pope, no bishop, they can come in with all their titles. They can't take it from you. You know. You can come in with any kind of theology, any kind of new teaching. I know. I know. I know him. I saw him. He touched me. He healed me. He changed my life. So with your theology, with your degree, with your books and with your papers and with all your big churches, there is nothing you will say. And I pray for you that you standing before God this morning, if you have not encountered him through his word, I pray that the Holy Spirit will breathe upon you. That the entrance of his word will bring light to your soul today. I pray for you. I pray for your children. I pray for anyone in the prison of the past today that is still struggling with an attitude, still struggling.